Hello and welcome to Governing Pandemics 101, an online course offered by the Global Health Center of the uh, Graduate Institute in Geneva. My name is Gianluca Burci. I'm an adjunct professor of international law here at the Graduate Institute. And this is session two of the um, online course. The title of the session is International Roles and Rules in Detecting and Responding to Outbreaks. And it will be composed of two mini lectures. The one I'm going to offer you now will talk about the role of the World Health Organization, WHO, and in particular the International Health Regulation, and some of the tools that the international community has at its disposal to uh, prevent, respond, and uh, detect outbreaks of disease. So, uh, no need to say that COVID-19 has been an unprecedented crisis. The people that call the crisis of a century, the crisis of a lifetime. It is a health crisis, but it had devastating effect, 360 degrees. It touched our lives, it touched the economy, it touched in the international politics, and so on and so forth. And so, there's, both in policy setting and in academia, there's a lot of discussion about the causes of this, the long-term effects, but also what it has shown in terms of the fragility of the world, the vulnerability of the world to something which seems as banal as a virus circulating among humans. We should be used to it. The, there are many things to say, of course. I will focus on the legal and institutional aspects of what happened in the last couple of years, and as I said, in particular, on the role of WHO and the international health regulation. So, first of all, I hope and assume that you know at least the very basics about WHO. It's an intergovernmental organization set up in 1948. It's an independent organization, but part of the United Nations system. It's very universal. It has 194 member states, and it has a governance, including a health assembly that meets uh, for a week every year, an executive board, a secretariat led by a director general currently, Dr. Tedros, who has been in the front line of the newspaper and the, in all the media in the last two years, very regionalized organization, very strong regions that also uh, impact in what WHO can do in responding to, uh, to diseases when you need a certain command and, and control. The mandate of WHO is very broad. It spans most aspects of public health. It is not like a hospital. It is similar to a Ministry of Health in terms of its role. Uh, in terms of normative role, policy setting, a technical assistance, being a forum for negotiation. Obviously, uh, when you're in existence for 70 years, many things change and your functions adapt. But it's fair to say that the uh, prevention and response to epidemics and uh, infectious diseases are at the core of the, of the very nature of WHO, of its reason for existence. And that comes from a long history of international cooperation in the, in, the, in the field of public health, going back to, uh, to the 19th century. So, um, what has WHO been doing? And we can use COVID-19 as an example. Um, it has definitely a number of roles, a normative roles, and the international health regulation are at the center of this, but also a, a policy setting roles. It has helped member states to come together and to try to take policy decisions on what to do in responding, not only responding to COVID, but also preparing for the next pandemic. We are already looking at the next pandemic, believe it or not, but also assistance to, to many states and uh, trying to coordinate and participate in other uh, important multilateral initiatives, like the famous COVAX. You will have uh, heard about COVAX that try to ensure an equitable allocation of COVID vaccines. Let's start with taking a look at the international health regulations. I use IHR uh, for brevity, are a binding legal instrument. They are not a recommendation, they are similar to a treaty. I will not go into details on how they enter into force and so on, but the there's no doubt that states must comply with their obligations. And so that's one of the purposes of the IHR. Um, it is a very universal instrument. It has 196 states. Basically, every state in the world is party to the, uh, to the IHR. It reflects the high priority given by WHO in having harmonized rules for the whole world. Because if you don't have 
at least a basis of harmonization of response, it is very difficult to protect yourself from epidemics, from pandemics. And I'm afraid that COVID has shown the price that we have paid in the lack of coordination, in the lack of unity, if you want, in the response to, uh, to this. So the IHR, with all the criticism that we look at in a moment, is still the centerpiece a legal, operational, but also from a policy perspective in, in trying to prevent and respond to outbreaks or diseases. What are some of the main features of the IHR? And let me add, the IHR has been thoroughly revised in 2005. Uh, IHR is, is an old instrument that even predates WHO, but its model was very obsolete was based on a list of diseases, was based on a very static model of cooperation. And so after the SARS pandemic in 2003, member states decided we need something more contemporary, more up to date, that really uh, respond to the globalization of risk. And so it was uh, revised in 2005, entered into force in 2007. What are some of the features of the, of the IHR? One is it's a modern instrument in the sense that you, it's open to all risks, not only the COVID kind of risk or the natural spread of a pathogen, but also, for example, a chemical spill that spread disease internationally or a nuclear accident or even an act of terrorism that bioterrorism, for example, where disease spreads uh, across countries. So you, you can already see how political it can be. It's not just public health. It had to do with national and international security, and that's a very distinctive features of the, of the IHR. Its approach is also very modern because it's based on a dynamic uh, joint work between WHO and member states in detecting an event, assessing the risk, managing the risk. So it has not always performed to what we expected, but the philosophy of the instrument, I think, is very solid and is very representative of the globalization of risk in the 21st century. What do states have to do? First of all, they need to have what we call core capacities, and I'll, I'll talk about that in my second lecture. Second, they have two obligations to due diligence, good faith, and transparency. They need to be able to detect outbreaks in the, in the territories. They need to assess what's happening. They need to inform WHO, inform other states, continue to provide information. It's really transparency and good faith. And if you remember in January, February 2020, that was some of the problems, the criticism against China, whether legitimate or not. But so that's a fundamental issue of, of, uh, of I would say, good citizenship. The other is limitation in national measures, self-restraint, and that's another problem in COVID. You can, states can adopt a protective measure, but they, they have to do that in accordance with science, with evidence, and somehow be restrained, also for uh, solidarity with other states. Uh, Road WHO is very striking. The IHR has been defined as a managerial instrument because WHO, the Secretariat of WHO, has really a central role in performing surveillance, in trying to detect uh, outbreaks through the internet, through social media, through information that it can get from various sources, and so on. The, uh, it has a dialogue with states, again, it's not a static model. Uh, it can receive information, impart information, using very aggressively its website to receive information and give guidance and information, and COVID has been a very good test of the importance of the uh, IT technology uh, for the purpose of global health. It has a striking uh, risk management power. It can declare an emergency, public health emergency of international concern. It can adopt uh, recommendations on what to do to uh, respond to these emergencies and so on. It seems um, something like logical and normal, but it is not. If you look at other technical organizations, there are not many that have this very striking, uh, I would say, operational and, and managerial powers. The other compromise uh, is what we call the grand bargain. Uh, in other words, states have given a lot of power to WHO, have accepted to take like a back seat. They're not at the center of the management of emergencies, WHO is. 
But in return, they've kept for themselves the power, the authority to take final measures for the protection of the population. And we've seen in the case of COVID, uh, travel restriction, trade restriction, compulsory quarantine, isolation. You cannot even go back to your country for a long period of time. And this they can do legitimately and legally under the IHR. There is an Article 43 that was one of the most difficult to negotiate. But obviously, it's a grand bargain that has its problem, its drawbacks, because states have a, quite a huge discretion in what to do without much accountability. And that, that, I think, is shown the limits of this model. And that's something that many states want to fix or at least to correct uh, in the future. And then finally, if you uh, uh, manage risks so broadly, uh, inevitably measures will impact and will interfere or will interface with other bodies of international law. Think of trade limitation, for example. Think of travel restriction, the limit human rights. And so the, if you look at the IHR, the way that they've been designed to try to be as consistent as possible with other bodies of international law, to try to avoid conflicts where a state has to say, either I respect my human rights obligation or I comply with the IHR. That's a very undesirable state of affairs. There has been a very conscious uh, effort to try to reconcile the different bodies of law. The role of WHO obviously goes beyond the management of the IHR. Uh, as I said, um, it has um, a broad uh, role. It has acquired an um, operational and emergency role after the Ebola outbreak in 2014. It set up an emergency program that does things the WHO never did before. And one of the striking um, aspects of COVID is that the IHR had disappeared for a while. If you look at the website of WHO, if you get, go back to 2020, WHO itself did not mention the IHR for quite a long time. Uh, you, you will remember all the guidance that WHO put on the web, on the wearing of masks, on the transmission of COVID, on what to do in case of emergency, how to ensure uh, that the public health wouldn't stop with COVID. All these very important recommendations and guidelines and information were put on the web outside the framework of WHO. Why is that? Precisely because of the limits and the challenges uh, that the uh, COVID-19 has uh, revealed on the model of response or the model of management of crisis focused on the IHR. What are some of these limits and what is being done about them? First of all, uh, a sense that the alert system the WHO has been using is too binary. Right now, either we have an emergency or we have nothing. And reality is more complex than that. So there are proposals in the future, hopefully, reform of the IHR to replace this very binary black and white system with something much more incremental, much more context sensitive. The second is the core capacities, and I'll talk about that in my second lecture. The, the third is that, the, <clears throat> unlike many normative treaties, think, for example, of many environmental treaties, the IHR don't have an institutional system of accountability, of monitoring and assess compliance. That's a huge gap, a huge flaw. That is, for example, uh, allowed countries to impose all these unilateral measures without any clarity whether they are complying with the IHR, breaching the IHR. It has prevented mutual learning among states and so on. So that, to me, is a major problem. The other is a, uh, <clears throat> the dependence of WHO on states uh, to get information. As I said before, WHO in principle can get information from many sources, but from political reasons, from reasons of being a member state-driven organization, it has always hesitated to basically put unverified information online. And this has been a, a barrier sometimes to give a timely alert, to be quicker, uh, and again, go back to uh, early 2020, you remember all the criticism about China not being very transparent and so on. Uh, another weakness, another challenge is and that's very important, is the insufficient incentives and deterrence. Uh, go back to the end of 2021. South Africa 
uh, notify this Omicron variant. So South Africa did what it was supposed to do in the IHR. Immediately, a number of countries panicked, overreacted, and suspended flights, did things that basically deter another country from coming clean, from being transparent, and so on. So having a set of deterrents and incentives would be very important in ensuring the effectiveness of the, of the IHR. Another important point, and I'm sort of rattling off all these, all these problems, is the limited scope of the IHR. IHR is all about detection and containment. It has proved ineffective at coordinating an international response to a grave uh, emergency like COVID, and it does not address the prevention, how to prevent the outbreaks from occurring. For example, jumping from animal to humans. That's why we have all this discussion about the pandemic treaty that will we, we, we pick up where the IHR has left. A, another couple of challenges, one is financing. Obviously, you cannot have a credible system of health protection if you don't have adequate financing. And financing for two aspects. One is national capacities. The other way, what we call a bit rhetorically, is global, global public goods. For example, facilitate research and development, scientific operation, um, uh, manufacturing of vaccines, allocation of vaccines, and so on. There are many discussions that go way beyond WHR, uh, WHO, have to do with the United Nations, with the G7, with the G20, with this political network, of what is a credible system of financing global health security will be. And of course, this will have an impact on also the effectiveness of the IHR in the future. So what is happening now? These are some of the challenges. I could mention more, but just to give you a sense of what COVID has revealed in terms of the, of the limits of the IHR. The Health Assembly has set up in May of last year a working group open to all member states that is to look at the various recommendations and the various reviews to make proposals on how to improve the um, international system of global health security. Part of this is looking at the IHR. Uh, the United States in January of this year has proposed quite a broad set of amendments that will be considered by the Assembly, by the Health Assembly in May. But there's not been much discussion about that. I don't think that it will be adopted uh, in May. And so the work will continue beyond May 2022 at looking at the IHR as a part of a broader system of global health security and will probably spill over into 2023 and hopefully the convergence on what is what is supposed to be done um, will uh, make it possible to improve these instruments and also to strengthen the role of WHO in, in, in future pandemics if not in trying to end this one.